Okay, welcome again to the Explaining History podcast. I am delighted to uh, welcome um, author James McManus to the podcast today. Um, James has experience for the Guardian newspaper as the uh, one of the newspaper's Africa correspondents um, dates back to the 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 the, the, the period of decolonization. Uh, in the 1970s, uh, through to um, the the end of uh, white rule in uh, Rhodesia, which then became Zimbabwe, um, and James's new novel, Love in a Lost Land, features some of the kind of the experiences that that he had uh, covering this very turbulent piece of history. So we're going to talk a bit about the book and uh, a lot about the the, the period. Um, so for, firstly, James, welcome to the podcast. Um, Thank you very much indeed. Um, firstly, let's just talk a little bit about about the book. Um, th- is this your your this isn't your first work of fiction? I'm guessing. No, it's the actually the eighth novel that I've written. Okay, okay, um, and it, it's um, related to your experiences uh, in in Southern Africa. Perhaps you can tell us a bit about uh, a bit about the plot and a bit about the context as well. Yeah. Well, the context is that I was the Guardian's Africa correspondent and um, was actually based in Paris when the Portuguese coup happened in 1974, April. Mm -hmm. That opened up the colonies of Angola, Mozambique and Guinea-Bissau to the liberation forces who uh, were given independence by Portugal. And that immediately triggered all sorts of conflicts in southern Africa, which was centered on uh, Rhodesia. Right. Rhodesia right. then was, as I think we all know, a rebel regime, widely regarded as racist. And it was to that country that I was sent by The Guardian in 1974 to report on the development of events there, of events. Okay. And um, that's the that's the setting for this for this book. Mm-hmm. And with the, um, the the kind of the, the, the story of Rhodesia, um, Britain, obviously, throughout the 1960s, was going through a process of the, the decolonization of, of um, its African colonies. But obviously, it, Rhodesia is one of Britain's African colonies where there was white minority rule. Um, in places like, obviously, Ghana, that's not the case, but in Rhodesia yeah. it is. Yeah. And so decolonization for Labour and Conservative governments becomes more complicated Perhaps for those that don't know the story, um, you can give us a sort of an overview of, of what actually happened. Yeah. Uh, the crucial aspect of Rhodesian history is that in 1923, it was granted the status of self-governing colony mm-hmm. uh, within the British Empire. And uh, from that moment onwards, the small white minority there had political control. Uh, and this they exercised um, to build up the country uh, and to do so in cooperation with the African majority. When I say in cooperation with, what I mean is there was an unseen and unspoken partnership created. The black African population, with the vast majority, provided the workforce, the labour, and the white, small white population brought in the technology. Mm-hmm. And one shouldn't uh, forget there was a huge technological shock that had taken place in Africa as elsewhere, with the arrival of the railways. So that was a situation which uh, prevailed throughout the Second World War until the early 50s, when a new generation of young Africans were coming out of universities in Southern Africa and began to, formation, to form a liberation movement to do what had been done elsewhere in Africa, to get independence based on majority rule. So that's the situation that prevailed in the 60s when the small white minority regime in what was then Salisbury declared unilateral ind- independence and mm-hmm. broke away from that was the background to the country that I found in April 74. Sure. And uh, the obviously this um, uh, the, 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 the white um, minority uh, openly defy uh, the British government. They do, um, and you find um, a particular character, Ian Smith, who I think we'll probably will will we'll discuss a bit more in a moment, um, with the uh, the governments of, of Wilson and Heath become essentially the the, the, the bane of their existence, um, and, and all of a sudden 
the process of decolonization becomes an awful lot more kind of complex, really. Tell us about Ian Smith as a character. Who was he? Um, I once interviewed Ian Smith. Um, uh, he was a farmer, a regional farmer. He'd been a World War II uh, fighter pilot, a Spitfire, a Spitfire pilot. Um, he was a man of very limited intellect. I wouldn't call him stupid, but I think he operated within a very sort of tight range of opinion. And he was extremely right wing. He believed, as he said repeatedly in public, that majority African rule should not prevail for a thousand years and so on and so forth. Um, when he broke away from Britain or his party did the Rhodesia Front, he left the government in London with an almost impossible sort of task because immediately the British government ruled out any military response. Mm. It would have been very difficult, really impractical, to fight what was a very small and very uh, loyal Rhodesian army, that is loyal to the concept of white rule. Mm. What, what, if anything, were his, uh, obviously, you know, from uh, the late 1940s onwards, uh, an openly racist white supremacist regime establishes itself in South Africa. Um, were, I, I would imagine that there were sympathies uh, between the uh, the white regime in uh, Rhodesia uh, and and the apartheid regime in South Africa. Is that is that absolutely? True? No, there's no, no question. Um, and the Rhodesian War, as it became known, could not have lasted throughout the seventies as it did for six long years without South African uh, military support and support in breaking sanctions. And mm. sanctions were crucial because this was the only weapon really uh, open to the British government. And they applied sanctions on everything except for medical products and educational products. Um, and yet it didn't work. It didn't work because there was South Africa uh, behind Rhodesia, a huge uh, country um, with its own huge apartheid problems, of course. And um, it was South Africa that allowed that, that uh, colony, as it then still was technically, to survive for those years in the 70s. Um, what do you think? Sorry, I'm just. I mean, one of the things I've always wondered is you. You have uh, London saying, "Well, we want to grant uh, Rhodesia or Zimbabwe as it will become independence, um, but in within a certain kind of within certain kind of conditions, and, and not the conditions of, of white minority rule." Um, why? What was preventing? the Heath and Wilson governments from just washing their hands of the whole thing, saying, you know, doing what they did, essentially did with Palestine uh, and saying, you know, we, we've, we're walking away. Uh, there was huge pressure on, well, let me answer that very quickly. There was huge pressure on, on, on the government in London, whether it was Labour or Conservative, from African states and from the United Nations mm. and equally from America, who which wanted to see the end of this. America's situation, of course, was, um, cynical, because Rhodesia produced, amongst other minerals, chrome, and right. America needed that chrome. It was a major supplier. And therefore, the Senate passed a legislation allowing the Americans to trade with Rhodesian chrome or in Rhodesian chrome, despite sanctions. And that right. was one of the many sort of moral complexities of the situation. And if I can just point this out, nothing is uh, totally simple when one looks back at the Rhodesian um, conflict. No. Because with six million African population and with quarter of a million whites, it was quite clear that if the African population had simply stopped work for a week, for instance, mm. the regime would crumble. They mm. were utterly dependent upon African labor in a whole range of uh, different sort of uh, areas. And what is more, the Africans took a sizable sort of uh, role in the security forces of Rhodesia. Right. Uh, there was the Rhodesian African Rifles, a regiment, a, a battalion which grew to four battalions by the end of the conflict. There were Africans in the police forces, in the uh, special forces, and so on and so forth. Mm. Now, one has to ask oneself, what were they doing? Why were they not fighting for independence? And the answer to that question lies in the very troubled tribal nature of Rhodesia, with two large and separate tribes. Um, and it was because of their age-old conflict that we see a lot of uh, Africans, mostly from the Indebelli people, joining 
the Rhodesian Security Forces or the Rhodesian Police. Um, yeah. There were also other reasons for them to do so. Um, a young African man given the chance to train um, on with modern infantry weapons and so on and so forth, it was quite an attractive thing to do if you didn't mm. actually feel that you were being represented by one of the liberation movements. Yeah, yeah. And there's always, I mean, I, I mean, the, the fact that people are, are reasonably well, or if not reasonably well, but regularly paid when they, they serve in armies is often a thing that often gets overlooked. Exactly. Uh, uh, and that can be, you know, whatever your politics, a, a powerful and attractive inducement in... Uh, and it was. Uh, You're absolutely right to point that out. It's absolutely right. Yeah. They were well paid. So the the other kind of, um, you know, major character in, in this story is Robert Mugabe. And Mugabe's a curious character. Somebody who, uh, in 1980, when... Um, Zimbabwe becomes um, a, 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 an in, a, a becomes a, um, a, an independent uh, and a black majority rural state. To my knowledge, is generally was generally quite well thought of, um, and who by the end of his rule is seen as a kind of a murdering tyrant. Um, I suppose one of two things is is possible. Either Mugabe was this very fluid character. Uh, and it tra transformed into this arch reactionary over time, or people were tremendously naive about him in the first place. And what what are your thoughts? There's no uh, easy yeah. answer. There's no easy answer to the character of Robert Mugabe. I first met him in December 1974, when he'd been released, as had the other nationalists, under the terms of an agreement by which supposedly peace talks were to start and the transfer of power would be negotiated. Well, of course, Ian Smith very quickly stepped away from that. Um, but for a few brief days, Mugabe was there in Salisbury, as it then was called. I met him in his sister's house in Harare, the uh, the township. He was rubbing Vaseline into his legs. There had been very sort of dry, flaky from years in prison. And I spoke to him for about an hour, I suppose. He was a very cold, but intelligent, calculating character. He was trying to help me. I said that I'd heard he liked the poetry of T.S. Eliot because he'd done uh, postal degrees while in, mm -hmm. in, in prison with the South African University. And he said yes, but he wouldn't be drawn on which particular poems he liked of T.S. Eliot or whether there were other poets he liked. But he did quote me some of that verse so that I knew he wasn't telling any lies. And throughout the 70s, I saw Mugabe in various meetings of the Org Organization of African Unity while in exile up and down Africa and indeed in Geneva when there was a conference on Rhodesia in 1977, I think. Um, he was always the same. He gave nothing away. Mm. And it was very hard to, to uh, find out who the man was behind what was a mask. Of course, it was. Um, and, then, and then, you know, you, you have this, this kind of... Um... The, this 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 experience. I, I many years ago, as as a reporter here in Wales, um, I I met the the kind of the the the, the white Zimbabwean diaspora, uh, the people that had had fled Zimbabwe after um, independence, and it was at a time in the early two thousands when there was a lot. It, Mugabe was invading white farms in this sort of very, very kind of brutal and violent way, and you saw these pictures of. Uh, white farmers being beaten up and, and things like that, and so they were they were quite politically active in 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 the UK, still uh, getting a, a lot of uh, sympathy. I went round to interview them uh, to one of the guys once who who fled wow. Zimbabwe, and all over his his wall were kind of oil paintings of him and his mates with uh, assault rifles in the bush, having waged this guerrilla war as well. And that was the moment where I thought, hmm, OK, well, I, I I wonder who I'm talking to here. And so I, I guess the 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 kind of the the, the conflict in um, in um, Rhodesia and then Zimbabwe produced both winners and losers, but with kind of many, many shades of grey, you know, but 
how how did you find the the, the um particularly the 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 the, the white the, the white farmers who were who were eventually displaced what was your sense of them um these people were trapped in history because what became very apparent to me in my early years in Rhodesia was that quite obviously the white population was going to lose the numbers yeah. were against them the world was against them even south africa was beginning to lose uh, faith if you like in the whole Rhodesian project um, because South Africa had its own problems. It also wanted sort of to get some sort of relationship with the outside world, despite apartheid. Mm. And yet, when that when I put this to additional farmers, and I went round and saw a lot of them, in particular those in the operational areas where life was pretty dangerous, they just refused to see it. They thought they had some built something which was worth fighting for. And to some extent, they had built up or were helped with the outcome to build up a remarkable country. Mm. The, the 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 technology, the farming, the roads, the infrastructure uh, was all very, very, very good, way beyond anything else in Africa. But they had an emotional attachment to this country, which was partly the product of some, if, what you might call brainwashing, if you like, by, by the regime itself. And partly because there was a history there. That country had started with a flag planted in 1890 mm. in, in the middle of the country. And they felt attached to the sort of pioneer spirit which had created the country. Yes. But it was a losing proposition. It was suicide. And when I discussed this with them, they just didn't get it. It always amazed me that, that intelligent people could actually think there was something worth fighting for down there. Was there a sense amongst them that they saw, saw a way of winning? No. To be fair to them, by 1975-76, no one ever thought there could be outright military victory. Yeah. What they were fighting for, and this did make more sense, was some sort of deal which could allow for power sharing. Yeah. Well, I, I did have to point out in conversations with these people that if you looked up and down Africa or anywhere else in the world, the concept of power sharing between two rival entities or tribes, if you like, or peoples, that never works. No. And, um, uh, and But that was their hope. That was what kept them fighting. The other reason I should explain is there's a sort of an emotional context here. If you've been fighting and some of your friends or family have been killed, yeah. you want to go on fighting for revenge. So there's yes. that sort of yeah. element in it too. Yeah. And you find, I mean, there's a version of this in every instance of settler colonialism in, in, in the world. Um, you know, you, you if you look even at, back at the way that um, sort of Germans viewed the the kind of what they viewed as the kind of the stolen lands in um uh, in, in in that were eventually part part of Poland you know you have to go yeah, all yeah. the way back to sort of stories of the Teutonic Knights invading in in, in various kind of Eastern Crusades and um, them yeah, being, yeah. doing that that as ours and the the people that happen to be on the land now well they're sort of an inconvenience or um you know they they haven't done very much with the land or um there was nobody here or, or kind of some other sort of sort of fiction and everywhere you look from kind of the americas to um uh, kind of parts of asia where there was white settler colonialism vietnam for example you find the kind of like a version of the thing you're talking about right there and a sense that you know if you're a, a, a white settler colonist who's actually been born in africa um, there, there was some in, years ago that I met some essentially white settler colonialists who were born in Kenya, and the first thing they referred to themselves as was Africans, uh, and that's right. what they thought of themselves as. Um, and and you know whether that's right or whether that's wrong, that's how they saw it, and that's. that's me, sorry, that, yeah, that's absolutely how the, the white religions saw themselves as Africans. And some could trace their family back three generations to those pioneers that I mentioned who came yeah. up on uh, horses and wagon carts from, yeah. from the south and established the colony in, in 1890. Yeah. Um, that's and right. I, I suppose it's a bit much for them to take lectures from, say, America on, uh, <laughs> on this sort of thing, you know. Um of course, yes, I, mean, yes, I, yes. I suppose that the, the 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 final figure in this story, if we go go back in time, is actually Cecil Rhodes, who 
perhaps is responsible for 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 most of of of, of what followed. The, I mean, obviously Cecil Rhodes has been this figure of, of huge controversy in the last ten to fifteen years here in in Britain with sort of. Um, you know, campaigns to remove his his statue from um, various places, uh, various universities. Um, I mean, to what extent would you say that the the conflicts that you saw were the the sort of the the product of him directly? Well, that doesn't really apply to countries like Kenya, Tanzania, um, yes, at all, because he he didn't sort of reach that far. Sure, Rhodes was an old fashioned Victorian imperialist. Um, who was doing uh, no more than what we had done in India, if you like, trying to expand the British Empire. It's very hard for us now to look back and think of the British Empire as a sort of a, a viable context or, or, or viable concept, I should say, um, and or indeed a viable project, if you like, because inevitably it wasn't going to last. And it didn't take very high intelligence to see that. Yeah. Um, but Rhodes put a huge building block in place in Southern Africa. And... Um, we we shouldn't forget that when independence came, Mugabe was taken aside by Samora Michel in Mozambique, president of Mozambique, and by president of Nereri in Tanzania, and told that he had inherited, quote, a jewel in Africa, and that he should keep the white farmers on the farms and keep the white infrastructure, but just change the political nature of the country. And Mugabe reluctantly did that. Mm. And the extraordinary thing about Mugabe was that not only did he keep white farmers on the farms, he employed Dennis Norman, the white, the former white uh, agricultural minister in his own government, and he appointed other white uh, officials in his administration. Mm. So he was open to the whole concept, if you like, of um, a white ruling class, but with uh, the, you know, the, the black politics on top. Yeah. Uh, that didn't last very long, of course, but that was what he did. And that was a recognition by those African leaders that what had been created in Rhodesia was quite exceptional in terms of Africa, and they wanted it to continue. Yeah. And um, I, I guess that, that's the, the sort of the pragmatic way of looking at um, Rhodesia, Zimbabwe, um, not to, you know, kill the goose that, that, that lays golden eggs. But of course, that's that is what Mugabe does. And I think it's worth pointing out that for every white farmer that was displaced or murdered by Mugabe, many, many more black Zimbabweans died. How do we how do we sort of make sense of that? This um, kind of Zimbabwean nationalist leader who is, is guilty of killing far more Africans than he is Europeans. Yes, uh, that's a very good point. Well, I, the way I would put it is this. The Rhodesian War has never really ended. What has happened in Rhodesia by way of independence has not benefited the people of Zimbabwe. I'm yeah. sorry, what's happened in Zimbabwe has not benefited the, the people, particularly the rural population. If you look at the situation now under President Mnangagwa, uh, the, the vast majority of the rural population are worse off now than they were at independence. Yeah. If you haven't got foreign currency, it's very hard to buy so much as an aspirin in Zimbabwe now. Mm. And for all the dressing that goes around the regime and for all the PR and for all the propaganda, that is a fact. Yeah. Um, why did it happen? Why did this man, Mugabe, who accepted the idea of using white technology and using white uh, uh, administration, what turned in? What went wrong? Because it went wrong very quickly, Nick. It yeah. was within 18 months that Mugabe unleashed the Korean trained 5th Brigade on the Indebeli people in the southwest. Mm. That's because they were basically from a rival nationalist group. The group had never got on the <coughs> Zapu and with the Mizanu. And there was a fear amongst uh, Mugabe's administration that there was going to be some sort of armed coup, armed rebellion down there. Uh, I don't think anyone believed that then, and it certainly isn't credible now. But what happened in that campaign, and this is 18 months for independence, was mass slaughter and mass rape on a really unimaginable scale. And that sort of built into the country at such a deep divide, it's still there today. Right. So when I say the Rhodesian War has never really ended, it certainly hasn't ended for the, or the consequences uh, haven't ended 
with the people, the vast majority of the people in, in, in Zimbabwe. And that is nothing short of an absolute tragedy. Yes. And and when we look at that that kind of that divide within the country, how would we best describe that? Is it a sectarian divide, an ethnic divide? These two completely different peoples and uh, are hemmed into, uh, is it a linguistic divide? Um, well, it is linguistic. It's, no, it's purely tribal. I mean, that is what it is. And we shouldn't sort of uh, try and pretend that that is a, a situation common only to Africa. You, no. you can look at us and the Scots and us and the Welsh and us and the Irish in particular. Yes. Uh, and see, if you look at the history of the English and the Irish, it's a, it's a very violent and uh, shameful history. Yes. So it's not as if this is purely an African trait. Um, but it is Remember certainly the, the Flemish and the Walloons in, in Belgium. Well, go on, go on forever, yeah. Mm. Um, but it's certainly true in Zimbabwe that the, the tribal uh, divisions remain as strong today, really, as they were then. Yes. Um, I, I noticed when, when Mugabe passed away, and he 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 was um he was replaced that there was a kind of a, bl- a brief flurry of um yeah, around kind of western capitals and let's let us go and speak to the successor and um you know kind of make make nice with him but uh, uh, you know and i say this from my limited knowledge it, it seems as if um, it's there's a, a kind of a, a different person in charge, but sort of much the same kind of approach. Is that is that fair to say? It certainly is. The corruption, the the corruption, the suppression of any dissent, the suppression of any political opposition, has continued today under Mnangagwa, much as it was under Zimbabwe. And yeah. as I say, it's 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 a it's shameful. It's a tragedy. And it's one that uh, African nations don't really recognise, and certainly don't do anything to to change. And they, it, it has kind of enhanced the. I mean, for, for the kind of reactionary commentator who believes that um, you know the empire was a largely benign exercise, and you know savage natives should be under the tutelage of, of white imperialists, and it's, that's what's best for them. That that argument, and this is what I heard a lot of when I was in, engaging with um, uh, white Zimbabwean emigres in in the UK. That argument is greatly enhanced. You know, when we were in charge, we lo- looked after, you know, we looked after them, and, and you know, but of course that's not really true either, because um, obviously, uh, you know, colonialism carried its own sort of burdens and and um, impositions and hardships. Yeah. Look, if you take a very short term view, you can find people in Zimbabwe, and I still have contacts there, uh, uh, African people who will tell you that they were much better off under Ian Smith than they are under Mugabe or Mnangagwa. That is certainly true in terms of access to medicine, education and just uh, you know, a peaceful society. Um, and it's equally true to say, and it's not something that uh, an awful lot of people like to recognise, that race relations in the old Rhodesian era were way better than they were, for instance, in South Africa, where apartheid was an absolute sort of brutal regime. Yeah. I mean, uh, when I was there, you could take Africans to dinner in hotels and so on and so forth and, and meet them quite openly all over the place. Um, but that's a very short term view. You're quite right. In the long term, there's absolutely no way uh, we have to sit back and recognise that white rule in Africa was, if you like, this what's produced this situation. I'm not quite sure whether that's an accurate thing. But certainly in the long term, history will see Africa as having unshackled itself from imperial and colonial rule, uh, but has yet to find a future. And when that happens, we just don't know. And how that no. happens, we just don't know. No. Um, and I, I guess one, I'm, you know, one of the, you know, to take a slightly different example and look, look at South Africa, say, um, you know, one, one, of, one of the great sort of disillusioning moments, I suppose, of the 21st century is to watch its... This this kind of um, decline of things like the ANC from being this sort of you know, revolutionary liberation movement uh, under Mandela to being a kind of a often widely disliked, um, corrupt uh, and or increasingly authoritarian uh, party um, that uh, is is embroiled in all sorts of kind of un- unpleasant scandals. But perhaps that that is the nature of of, of what happens when. When when revolutionary organisations establish themselves, 
Um, there are numerous examples of it, I suppose. Yes, yes, absolutely. I just want to talk a little bit about um, the way that my book um, oh, yes, of uh, um, <laughs> tells a story of what I found there in the 70s. Please do. Um, because that's what we are yes, okay. doing. I was a correspondent based there for The Guardian in the, in, in, in the, in the 70s. And that experience um, was probably the most vivid of my life, if you like. Those six, yeah. seven years I was in Africa. I was a young man in my 30s. And it stayed with me for all those years. This is 50 years ago we're talking about. Yeah. And I've always wanted to write about it yeah. and to somehow uh, come to terms with what I saw there yeah. and the relationships I had there with people like Mugabe, Joshua Nkomo, uh, and many other nationalists who I knew quite well because we met them all the time outside the country. And I've written this book, which is a novel, but it's very much based not just on what happened then, yeah, the, the kind of society I found then, but my own experiences in terms of personal relationships. And essentially, this book is about a love affair in a time of war. And yeah. it's an interracial love affair between a white magazine writer, a.k.a. obviously for anyone who reads the book myself, and an African school teacher called Patience. And it's that that affair in the context of war, which I think gives the book um, its dramatic appeal. Yeah. And it's emotional appeal because that basically happened. And yeah. um, the, the the story comes to an ending, which I don't want to give no, away no. to your listeners right now. Spoiler alert, uh, no. But I think it's a, a book which will be, appeal well beyond those who know about the Rhodesia Zimbabwe conflict. Yeah. Have feelings about Mugabe or indeed Zimbabwe. Well, interestingly, on the final note, not to kind of big you up out of all proportion, but I'm just reading a, one of the various biographies of Graham Greene at the moment, and I thought of you when I when I was um, when I was, I was preparing this um, podcast, and I was um, I was reading this biography about how he took the kind of extraordinary things he was involved in and sort of humanised them into human stories. Um, and I, I guess, you know, in a sense, that's that's what you're talking about here. And there's a, a I think Le Carre does that too, um, and and brings brings the the human heart into some 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 pretty heartless stuff, if if you will. Yeah. Well, I will say immodestly, Nick, that I, you're not the first person who's mentioned Graham Greene in the context of this book, and I would be extremely flattered if that really was the case. But yeah. Graham Greene is one of my literary heroes, and I don't think I quite rise to his level. Um, or maybe I do, I don't know. That's that's my sort of modest judgment. However, I think the key thing about this book, Love in a Lost Land, is that it tells a story and it keeps the narrative flow throughout what was an extraordinarily sort of busy and violent time in Rhodesia. Right. Um, and, uh, and the birth of Zimbabwe is there. It's there in the book, painful though it was, um, 